I'm the water conservation manager of the Mojave Water Agency. Uh, basically, what I do for the agency is I have been running the rebate programs for the agency. So we've run a cash for grass program for since 2008, and I have been in charge of that. And uh, recently, we enacted a large scale cash for grass program, which is focused towards uh, more larger scale uh, turf areas. Um, i.e. schools and uh, industrial complexes. And so we've been <clears throat> taking out grass on a larger scale through that. So that's kind of what I've been doing. Uh, my job has changed quite a bit with the new, uh, the way California is going right now. Uh, doing a lot more policy stuff. And so I've been traveling to uh, Sacramento and I've been actually recommending how the legislators can make decisions on the future of California's water. So that's kind of what you're going to see today is, is where the future of California's water is going, which direction it's going. So before I get started, I know I'm being videotaped, but I'm going to ask you a question. Are we still in a drought? Why are we still in a drought? Do you think we're in a drought? I'm going to give you some information that's, that, that's very important. So we have currently 26 rivers that are at flood stage, emergency flood stage, how are we in a drought? Not population. It's close. Somebody else have an idea? So we have flooding rivers. Well, all, all water that's Yes, all that water would be available. It needs to be treated, but it would be available, yes. Um, is it recharging water? Not necessarily. That's, that's kind of where I'm getting to. So we, we, we're not recharging our aquifers fast, and we're also not filling up reservoirs that we have. So we have reservoirs that are full, but we have reservoirs that are not full. And so that's where we're still kind of in a drought. So just because we have all this water, today was, or excuse me, this year was the most water that we've ever received in California history most rain ever in recorded history, the last hundred years. So obviously that should take us out of a drought. And, and theoretically, it does take us out of the definition of drought, which is a lack of rainfall, but it doesn't take us out of a, a water availability crisis that we're in. And that's because we don't have a way to keep the amount of water we need for the people that we have here. So that's kind of how I can describe what I'm doing now is saying that, that we're trying to fix that issue. So if we have these big rainstorms, we want to have the storage and the means to keep all that rain available for a longer period of time. So I'm gonna get into this. I'm sure you guys heard all about us already. Do you know all about the Mojave Water Agency? We actually haven't done a heck of a lot on it. Oh. We're waiting till you come back. Well, okay, well then I will, then I will, then I will, then I get to talk a little more about us. Super. So <clears throat> we were formed in 1960. We were, uh, uh, we are an elected body. So the, the Mojave Water Agency has a seven member elected body that makes decisions on, on water policy and water issues locally. We are a state water contractor. I heard somebody say that there's 29 state water contractors earlier. And so we are one of them. We are allowed to access the California aqueduct. No one else locally is allowed to touch that water. So if anybody else were to try to, you know, stick their hose in there and, and drain some of that water out, they could get in serious trouble. So our mission is, and I'm gonna kind of read this one, I'm not gonna read all the slides, but this one I will read. Um, our mission is to manage the region's water resources for the common benefit to assure stability and the sustained use by the citizens we serve. Now, there's two real key words in this statement that I'm gonna use, that I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of highlight, and it's stability and sustain. And, and those two words are, are basically us in a nutshell. We wanna make sure that our water levels stay stable. So we, we manage the water. We have an adjudication, which you're gonna hear about. We have um, people that are constantly measuring our water levels to make sure that they stay stable. And then sustained, that helps us get through our drought periods. So we just came out of a five-year drought, which was the driest period on record in California. And I just said, we, we have the wettest year. So how did we make it through five years of dry periods? And now we have our, our wet year. <clears throat> and so what we did, what we do, is we take those wet years beforehand and we make sure we manage that water efficiently enough 
so that we can get through five years and then we can make it to the next wet year. So California has cycles and it's typically five to seven years of dry, one to two of wet. And so last year we had a wet-ish. It was not the Godzilla El Nino that everybody said it was gonna be, but it was an above average wet year. And then this year we had El Nino, Godzilla El Nino that was delayed. So this year we, we got our El Nino. So we've had a, about a year and a half of really good rainfall. And so that's how we're gonna sustain ourselves for the next five to seven years. So where do we get our water from? Does anybody know where we get our water from? San Bernardino Mountains, where else? I'm sorry? No, La Hunton is a water quality control board. Runoff and aquifers, where else? Do we get? You're missing one. Well, you're missing one. No, no, I'm not. He's talking groundwater, and I'm not even talking groundwater because you guys have already answered that part of it. Where else do we get our water? We have two sources of water here. State water. So we get water from the California aqueduct, right? So we, we have what we call a natural supply, which is groundwater, right? So that's gonna come from the San Bernardino Mountains, and that comes down the Mojave River. It's going to recharge the, the aquifer through the Mojave River. Now, do, do, do we know where our water comes from when it comes from the San Bernardino Mountains? From two spots. We have two, riv two rivers that converge into the Mojave. Anybody know? Have you not done the, the tour yet? Have you done the tour of the Upper Mojave? No, Okay. Okay, so, so it comes out of Deep Creek. You guys have all heard of Deep Creek, right? And that's gonna end up originally coming from Lake Arrowhead. So Deep Creek starts by Lake Arrowhead, comes down the mountains, and then we have Silverwood Lake, or we call it the West Fork. So those two rivers come down. So Deep Creek and West Fork come down, they meet behind the Mojave Dam, and they come out and form the Mojave River. So that's where we get our water from as a natural supply. Then we have our artificial supply and that's gonna be our state water project. And so I'm sure you guys are gonna see the aqueduct or, uh, or hear more about it. Um, basically what we do is we have a siphon and, or, or, or an area where we take water out by the siphon and it goes into our recharge facility um, up in the Deep Creek area. <laughs> so, so the state water project is a series of canals, aqueducts, uh, water conveyance that comes from Lake Oroville. It comes all the way south to um, us and then it, it ends in Lake Paris. So if you guys know where all those areas are. Now, Oroville's been in the news a lot. Have you guys paid attention to all that in this class? I imagine with Neville being on top of current events that that's a big deal. Um, it's gonna, they are, they're estimating over a hundred million dollars in repair costs to fix Oroville, the dam at Oroville. So um, unfortunately, you people and us and me and Neville, we're, we're gonna be the ones who pay for that. So that's gonna be something that you're gonna see coming down in the future that you know we have to make sure we maintain this infrastructure and, and, and keep it so that we can use it in the future. So we talked a little bit about the drought, so I'm not gonna go too deep into this, but uh, here's some history of the drought. Um, in, in 2014, January 17th, um, Jerry Brown stood on a, a basically a, a meadow where there should have been 100 inches of snow below him, but he was standing on grass. And so that was the driest year that we've ever recorded for water, um, water precipitation, snowfall, all this other stuff. There was, there was the driest year ever. And uh, the way the State Water Project works is it bases on, based on all that snowpack and we got about a 5% allocation. So of our 89,800 acre feet, we were able to take 5% of that. Now contract, contrast that with today, we can take 60% of our water today. So it's a lot different when we have a lot of water. So after he declared this drought in uh, May 9th of 2016, he issued something called Executive Order B3716. It's also known as Making Conservation a California Way of Life. If you have any interest in becoming a water professional, I suggest that you read this. And I can show Mr. Neville where to download this, and I, 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 I'm going to implore him to make this some sort of a requirement for your class. Because this is going to shape water policy in California for the next 30 years. Okay.
Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, you don't need to read the whole thing, but there are definitely sections that you're gonna wanna look at, and I'm gonna kinda give an overview of it, but it has so many things that are gonna be changing the way we deal with water in the future. It's, it's, it's gonna be very, very, very important. So here's the four main aspects of this document. It's, the first one is gonna be use water more wisely. Then we're gonna have eliminate water waste, strengthen local drought resilience, and then improve agricultural water use efficiency and drought planning. So it's basically, we have three things that are gonna go directly to our urban suppliers, and then one that's gonna go for our agricultural suppliers. And they're all very important. So the first one in the executive order directives is be water wise. And this is going to kind of build off of the last year where we had the 25% mandatory conservation. You guys all remember that, right? Where everybody was up in arms because we had to mandatorily conserve 25%. Well, actually most of our areas here locally had to conserve up to 32% because we, we were considered high water users, which is, you know, we live in a desert, so obviously we don't use we don't get as much natural water and rainfall, so we have to, to artificially water our lawns and our, our landscapes. We have a lot of agricultural uses around here. So we were in the higher category. <clears throat> so this new Be Water Wise is gonna take that 25% and it's gonna start to change how we look at that. It's not gonna be mandatory anymore. Well, it could be if we go back into another dry state, but it's going to try to make it so we don't ever have to go back to mandatory conservation. Second one is gonna be eliminate water waste. This is gonna be starting to eliminate those, those permanent, permanently eliminate those, those water practices that are wasteful. So currently, we, we, we no longer hose down our driveways. That is actually a, 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 an infraction. It's the same as getting a traffic ticket. You can, you can get a ticket for that. Um, you can't water your, drive, water your driveway or sidewalks intentionally with your irrigation system. Um, if you're going to wash a car, you now need to use a hose uh, uh, it's called a positive closing hose nozzle. And the, third, the fourth one is uh, you can no longer have a non-recirculating uh, water feature that doesn't include potable water, that includes potable water. So those four things are now permanent. And all four of those things, if you're caught and blatantly doing things, they can, you can be basically getting a traffic ticket. And if you get caught more than once, there's a possibility that could become misdemeanors, all that kind of other stuff. So, so basically, if you hose down your driveway, you could be a criminal. So, so a water feature must recirculate its water. And if it doesn't recirculate its water, it can only be non-potable water. Yes. Oh, that's been in play for the last six months. Okay. You know the difference between potable and non-potable, yes? Okay. So, so if you have a water feature that's in, say, a, a city, and they're taking water out of the city water system, that is drinkable water, and refilling a, 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 a fountain or a, you know, a city park where they have, you know, you've all been to Palm Springs where you see all those water features when they when you drive around, there's, everybody has a water feature. So if you're using potable water, city water, you have to be able to recirculate that water. So it has to be recycled, reused more than once. It can't just go through the system and then out. Um, if you're gonna have one that goes through the system and goes out, it has to be a non-potable source. Does that make sense? Okay, so the third one, strengthen local drought resilience. This is gonna create um, common standards for, for a planning for a five-year drought. So basically what this one is, this is kind of the, the biggest part. And so if you guys read one section of this new document, which it's, it's a couple hundred pages, so it's, it's a lot of reading. But this section talks about how we're gonna plan five years in advance. And we kind of already do that. We do something called an urban water management plan, which is we every five years, we look ahead five more, up to 20 years. We do it in five year increments up to 20 years. And we determine how much water we're gonna have. 
And so basically our urban water management plan determines how much growth we can have locally. So in 20 years, if you don't have water, you can't build stuff. So, so, so today is 2017. If we run out of water in 2030, stay, okay? So that's 13 years from now, right? If you run out of water in 2030, then anybody who wants to build a Walmart, who wants to build a Home Depot, who wants to build any of these kind of big structures or whoever wants to build lots of houses, I'm st it's the, the, the government's gonna say, I'm sorry, we don't have enough water. You can't build this. It's against the law to build what you wanna build. No permits will be, will be issued. Nothing will be filed. You will not be able to build those things. Now, that 20 years, you have to be able to provide water for 20 years. So, so say you're at Walmart and you want to come in and build a new Walmart and your water is going to stop at 30, 2030. You have to then go find somebody who's willing to give up their portion of water in the amount that you need. You have to purchase it from them so you can sustain that. Then you can build a property. So it's, it's, it becomes a lot different when you're in this, this 20 year block of time that we have to look at. So what they're gonna do now is they're gonna take a five year look and they're gonna determine how much conservation you need to do. So for five years, we, we start looking. So it's gonna be supply versus demand, right? You've all who's taking economics here? Anybody? Okay, a couple people, that's good. So basically we have a water supply and we're gonna use a nice round number of 100,000 acre feet, right? So we have 100,000 acre feet here of supply. And in year one, our demand is 90,000 acre feet. So we're still good, right? We still have, we're still underneath that supply. There's 10,000 10, acre feet over. Year two, we have 95,000 acre feet. So we're still good. We still have 5,000 of, of leeway, right? Year three, we have a real big jump and we go to 110,000 acre feet of water use, right? So now what are we doing? We have more supply or less supply? Over? So we're over our supply. By how much? It's real easy math. 110,000 over 100,000. 10%, right? So we're 10% over. And so what they're gonna say is for this five year period, you need to start in year one conserving 10%, mandatory. So that you can, when you get to year three, you have extra water in your system that you can utilize. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's what this five-year look is gonna look like. Now, here's the big problem with this five-year look, is if you look at any five-year period in California, you are in a perpetual drought. You are always in drought. And so there's, there's some issues with this, but this is the way it's gonna look. So we have to, we're, we're, they're trying to figure out ways of, of making this not so cumbersome, but this is the current system that we're gonna be going into. Okay, so what are some of our water use efficiency targets? So, have you guys talked about 20 by 2020? Okay, well I guess I get the first crack at it. Fantastic, so 20 by 2020 was a law that came out in 2007. It's called XBX 7-7. And basically what it says is by the year 20, 20, so 2020, you're going to have to conserve 20% of your water over a 10 year baseline period. And so the baseline period was from 1995 to 2005, and you took your average water use over those 10 years, and you determined how much gallons per, per person per capita daily you use. And then in 2020, you're gonna again calculate your, your GPCD, it's called gallons per capita daily, Okay, GPCD, you're gonna calculate that again, and you have to have had less than 20%. You have to use to less than 20% over your baseline. So if your baseline is 100, you now have to be at 80, okay? And so our baseline was somewhere around, I think it's 165, maybe a little higher, I don't know exactly, and we're right there. We're, right, we're actually at about 30% less in our area here. <clears throat> I don't know what the exact GPCDs are, I do know we're 30% under. So basically what they're doing is, is the, they've taken this 20 by 2020. Well, in the future, after 2020, this is the new, this is the new targets, okay? So it's gonna be more intensive than 20 by 2020. So basically what, what they're gonna do is they're gonna calculate your new GPCD, you know, what your, what your, what your goal is by using these, these metrics. So indoor water per capita. Does anybody know how much water we use per person per day indoors? 
California. That's total. I'm thinking just indoor, just to flush your toilet, shower, and you know, run your dishwasher, run your washing machine. Anyway, take a guess. You're close, but you're a little low. He said 40, so somebody else want to take a guess? You're really close, almost there. You're one too high. Yes. <laughs> so 55 gallons, and that's going to be, so this first number is 55. Done. Now, it does go lower as the years go on. So in about six or seven years, it goes down to about six uh, gallons per person. So down to about 49 gallons. And that's because there's some laws coming out. Um, SB 407 is uh, taking effect at the end of this year. And that is going to be where all water fixtures in your house, if you sell your house or remodel your house, now have to be water efficient fixtures. So if you have an older house, and you have older toilets or older shower heads and you want to sell your house, you have to upgrade them before you can sell your house. That's going to be a new law. It's called SB 407. You guys should probably take a look at it because it's going to be coming, uh, coming up here at the end of the year. Okay, so the next one is going to be outdoor irrigation incorporating landscape area and climate. So this number is variable. Every area is going to be different for this number. What this is going to look at is what your ETAF is, okay? So that's your evapotranspiration, and that's going to be, AF has to do with your area and your climate, okay? So ETAF is going to be evapotranspiration, and then it's going to be adjusted for your climate, basically. It's gonna be adjusted down and up for how much landscape area you have. So that's gonna be something that's variable. So these, those, these are for, for houses, for residential houses, so you have indoor residential, and then outdoor residential. Yes, sir. Yes, correct. That's, that's, yes. So they're basically your, your ET, and, I, and your ET is basically how much water is lost from evaporation and transpiration. So as the sun beats down, your plants are losing water through transpiration through their leaves. And then you're also, any water that would be on the ground is also being sucked out through evaporation. So an ET is a culmination of those two, two numbers. And then what they do is, so that's basically your, your, your temperature, your, your, your solar radiation, all that kind of stuff goes into to ET. And they're going to uh, take that and multiply it basically by your landscape area. So we live in kind of a unique area. We're more of a rural community. We have larger uh, yard sizes. So they're going to take all that into account. That's that is something they're going they're looking at. The so Orange County was brought up. Orange County has typically smaller yards, but they have more landscaping. They get a little their ETs less than ours. So um, they're going to have a smaller water uh, number in this area, and we're going to have a little bit larger. So nobody knows what these are these numbers are yet. They they haven't done the studies yet. I would throw some numbers at you, but nobody knows. Oops, I'm sorry. So, and then the next one is gonna be water loss through leaks. This is going to be any water that's lost through your, your distribution system. So one of the big things that's coming out through that um, eliminate water waste, you saw eliminate water waste, right? Was about the prohibited water practice. Well, the other thing they're gonna do is they're gonna start looking for leaks, finding those leaks, fixing those leaks. There's a lot of technology that's coming out right now that's going to help people find those leaks, you know, more efficiently so they can know, you know, this is a five, this, this area here is where the leak is, as opposed to having to look all over the whole entire area for it. So this is gonna be like a percentage of these two numbers that we have to get to. Somewhere less than probably 7% will be allowed to be lost through leaks. So if you have, like we talked about 100,000 acre feet, you'll be able to lose less than 7% of that water, which is not a lot, okay? And then the next one is gonna be cons con commercial, industrial, institutional. So that's gonna also vary by area. So certain areas like we have um, the industrial complex in Victorville, they're gonna have a little bit different water requirement than say Apple Valley because they don't have as much industrial but they have more medical stuff. So the, all the numbers are gonna be different for these different um, uses, water uses. So all four of these added up is going to equal your new GPCD. What's GPCD for, stand for again? This is very important. G. <coughs> Huh? Well, how do we measure water? Gallons, Gallons per, per capita daily. 
And it's very important to remember GPCD because that's probably one of the biggest metrics that are gonna come out in the future to talk about how much water we use. Now, where do you fit into all this? So you guys are actually a lot closer than the people that I talked to at the Water Summit. You guys are actually in a class learning to be a water professional. They were kind of looking at maybe, hey, maybe this is something that we, I want to do, but you guys are definitely there. So these are the new laws that are going to be legislated in the next five to seven years when you have the ability to, to help with stuff. So new water use standards and targets, that's what we've kind of talked about with that last slide. We have a new water shortage contingency plan requirements. So a water shortage contingency plan basically is a document that if you run out of are going to run out of water, how we had that five year window of running out of water, when does it kick in and for how much? So water shortage contingency plans say step one is voluntary conservation. Step two, we're into mandatory five to 10%. Step three would be mandatory 10 to 20%, all the way up to 50%. Okay, so when we get to a really bad place, when we have no water, you can have up to 50% conservation, mandatory where basically if you're watering outdoors, they're gonna actually come and shut your water off. So when you're at 50% conservation, it's only indoor water use. So those are the, that's what a water shortage contingency plan is. It's, it's all these steps to get to making sure people conserve more water. So three is drought planning for small water suppliers in rural communities. So this area is very affected by this one. So we, have a 5,000 square mile area that we cover, and we have 46 water agencies that we cover. Somebody want to take a guess of how many of those would be considered small water agencies? I'm sorry. You're probably not even close. 36 are considered small water agencies. So we have nine or 10 that are considered large water agencies. And the definition of a large water agency is 30, or excuse me, 3,000 customers, 3,000 connections, or 3,000 acre foot served, or, well, those are, those are the two for, for large. And then, so, so anything small is less than that. So less than 3,000 people served or less than 3,000 acre feet served. So a lot of our small, or a lot of our agencies are small. So anybody live in Lucerne Valley? Okay, Lucerne Valley has like 20. Then we have like out going out to Joshua Tree because we, we cover out to there too. So there's a couple out there. Then we have like Hellendale, which they're kind of almost, they're almost a large. I can kind of consider them in the large. They're, they're three connections away from being an urban water supplier. So they're, they're almost there and they probably will be there in the near future. Um, but most of our water suppliers are very, very small. And so what they're doing now is, is they haven't been required to do a lot of drought planning in the past, but now they are. And it's all gonna be regulated by us and the county as to how they regulate their water supply and if they run out, where they go, how they intertie with other agencies. So some of these small water suppliers, they have like 12 customers, 12 houses, one well. What happens if that one well goes down for 12 customers, 12 houses? So now we're, now we're in a really, really bad spot, right, for these people. So that's what we're gonna work on, you know, making sure they have a backup plan. You know, what's plan B for, for these 12 houses? And, and it may be connecting to the next water system that's a couple miles away, and they have to put a pipeline in so that in case their well goes down, they still have access to water from some other area. Okay, and the last one is gonna be agricultural water management. This is kind of a big deal, more in the Central Valley. Um, what, we, what agriculture we have here isn't really affected by this because it's not at the same scale. Um, it is, I mean, obviously any agriculture should be affected by water efficiency, but um, a lot of this stuff is targeted more towards um, taking, uh, bringing in more drip irrigation and mapping your fields to make sure that you're as efficient, and po as, efficient as possible. So I'm sure that Mr. Neville has talked about GIS and uh, GIS is a huge part of this, and what they're doing is they're now mapping uh, a field. They're using GPS and GIS to map a agricultural field, and they're using infrared on top of on top of those maps to determine where you're inefficient in your watering. 
And so they can look at a map and it'll be obviously blues, greens, and reds. Reds being bad where you're not watering efficiently and you can adjust your watering to those specific areas to become more efficient and use your water better in an agricultural field. Okay, so this is what we asked here. So how much water do we use? We use about 189 gallons of water per person per day. That's gonna be everything except our agriculture because we don't really count them. Our, our urban water use is 189 gallons per person per day. That includes when you take a shower, when you flush the toilet, when you water your grass, also includes when you go to McDonald's to buy your hamburgers, or if you go to Walmart, wherever you go throughout the high desert and do stuff, you're using about 189 gallons per day. Okay, so that, does that seem like a lot or, a or not enough? Seems like a lot? Okay, so who drinks Starbucks? Okay, there's a gallon of water. Who drinks, who goes to get a hamburger? <laughs> I like this guy, he's the only one raising his hand. <laughs> this one over here in the blue. <laughs> it's all right, I don't mind characters, I can handle it. So, so, so you're, you're going to see in a minute how many gallons it takes to make a hamburger, but that's 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 to get the hamburger to McDonald's, and then to make, to get you know Mayor McDonald's hamburger, you're looking at probably two or three gallons per hamburger just to make that hamburger. Yes, sir. Well, okay, so we're also watering. No. Nope. Nope. I'm talking about use, only use. This is this is just local. Physical water that's pumped out of the ground and used, you're using 189 gallons per day. Where did you get that? Where did I get the 189? That's, that's my job. Oh, it's a, oh, 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 we're talking about alternative fa facts. I love it. All right, I've been accused of fake news. Yes! Not everyone uses that much but people use more. So say you use 60, there's somebody out there who uses 500. So it's an average. Basically what this number is, is we collect data from all of our water use, water agencies. They submit how much water we've used, okay? So we get water from Victorville, we get water from Apple Valley, we get water used from Hesperia. They're gonna tell us how much water was pumped and it's gonna, they're gonna tell us based on uh, residential, they're gonna tell us based on commercial, industrial, all these different water sectors is gonna tell us how much water they use. Then we take those numbers, add them up for a whole number for the whole area, and we divide that by the population. It's not an estimation at all. It's, it's an actual water number. They know how much water is pumped out of the ground. They have to know. The state requires them to know exactly how much water they pump. And so what they do is they tell us how much water they pumped, and then we divide that by population. And we know how much population we have because we have done studies on uh, forecasting. We look back at the last census, which is, which is a hard number. And then we can, we can judge forward five years based on Department of Finance um, percentages and our population forecasting. And we know how many people live here. There's about 453,000 people that live in our service area. And so we divide that by the total water use and we come up with how many average gallons. So yes, you're right, it is an average. I don't use this much water per person per day, okay? I know how much I use. I use, at my house, I use about 70 gallons per person per day. That's including my landscape. I have, I have grass, I have trees, I have a garden, I have all of it, but I'm very efficient because it's what I do for a living. <laughs> so I, but there are people who, who, who don't have stuff and they are very inefficient. So, you know. How long was your shower this morning? Okay, perfect. So you're you're saving the world. How about who, anybody, who took a, who took a long shower in here? You did. <laughs> We're coming to your house. <laughs> so so it's it's. Everybody's different, and, and yes, this is an average. So some people use this, some people use it right on, some people use more, some people use less. But on average, 189 gallons is what we're using. Like no. So when you go to Target and you buy something at Target, all the water that Target uses, it's it's accounted for in, in this number as well. Yeah, because like where I work at, like we use like a lot. Of like where do you work? Um, okay. So 
So basically, when somebody goes and orders a meal from you, they're, they're now maybe a gallon or two per meal because you're using a lot of water to clean and, and do other things, right? Is that what you're saying? And so, so that's what I'm talking about. When you go to eat something, you're, you're accounting for one or two, maybe three gallons to eat one meal because of the amount of cleaning that they have to do. In addition to that, like, I try to conserve as much as possible. Sure. Turn off the box. I, like, everyone else in there does not care. Like, they don't really. Like, there we go. The accessible water right in front. Like, we have to so like this guy over here and this guy over here who take long showers and don't care about water conservation, it's the same. So th there are people, and it's not necessarily they don't care about water conservation, they just, they just don't know. You know, this one over here, he should know by now that his shorter shower will save the world and will save the amount of water. He lives in Lucerne Valley where they have a very deep... <laughs> All right, so... We have, we talked a little bit about Kesher grass earlier. So about 11 million square feet of grass has been removed in the area. And, and I'm gonna go back really quick to, to the last slide. So 11 million square feet of turf. And, and you guys can do some quick math. Each square feet of turf is about 55.8 gallons of water saved per year. So that's a lot of water right 55 million gallons of water well a little more than that what is it 50 i don't know whatever 55 times 11 is okay so this number in the year 2000 somebody want to take a guess what that number was i love my background oh you can't focus because you see the guy giving the thumbs up okay well somebody take a guess somebody throw a number out at me uh, 250 is way low. Oh, really? Still low. Not, not that high. <laughs> How much did you say? You're high. 327 was the closest so far. We'll, we'll, we'll go with 386 gallons per person per day. So back in the year 2000, people were using a lot of water. If you look at our, we have a graph where you look at our water use from the year 2000 to the to today, it kind of went like this. It went up and then back down and it's at the same level it was in 1997 today. So in 1997, we used the same amount of water for about 150,000 less people. So do you think we're becoming more efficient or less efficient? Much more. So we're, I'm sorry? Because we've taken grass out, We've educated people on, you know, doing the simple things, turning off your water. You know, this guy comes and turns off faucets when they're not supposed to be on. S simple things like that. People are taking shorter showers. It's, it's all these little things that are lumped up into a big number. And so it's, it's you know, everybody kind of doing their part to, to make a little bit of a difference. And that's how we've gotten to this number. So. So, so we have some big projects that we've done for, uh, for our Cash for Grass recently. We, we've, we've discontinued our residential program, but we have gone into our large scale program. So, then we live in Asperia. Asperia School District, where I live, is taking out a half a million square feet of turf. So 500,000 square feet of turf just at the school district. Um, Apple Valley School District is taking out grass. Um, um, all the golf courses. Every single golf course in the high desert has signed up to take grass out. So the is there any golfers in the room? No golfer? Okay. So you don't really understand this, but the Green Tree Golf Course took out 1.3 million square feet of turf. So if you kind of want to do the math, that's 55 gallons times 1.3. You guys can figure out how many acre feet that is. Okay. So, oh, there it is. I didn't realize I had it in here. I forgot. There's another, another cool picture for you. I'm sorry. So how much water do we have in the entire world? I hope you've already talked about this, but fresh water makes up about 3% of our water in the entire, entire earth. So of the 100%, 97% of that water is salt water, unaccessible, undrinkable, something that we can't use. Of the 3%, there's approximately two thirds of that that we can't use because it's locked up in glaciers and ice caps. 
30% of that is in groundwater and less than 1% is surface water. Do you see all that surface water, all the rivers, all the lakes, all the streams, all the stuff in the world? It basically makes up 0.03% of all the water in the entire world. Not a lot, right? Luckily, we have this groundwater and 30% of our water is groundwater. So we, this local area, are 100% uh, de dependent on groundwater. And, and that's something that, um, that we, we, we use, we recharge, we do all this other stuff. So of the whole of the water in the entire world, only 1% is available to drink for humans. So this is, this is kind of, yes ma'am. Um, some of them are, yes. Carlsbad is online. I'm pretty sure they're still bringing Santa Barbara back online. Um, so yes. The problem with desalination is it's very expensive. It's not, it's not a problem, it's, it's a good source. It's a, it's, a, it's a drought proof source of water. It's very expensive and there are some environmental ramifications that can come with it because of the brine water that comes out. So, you know, we have, we have to, to make sure we, we do things the right way. There are issues, they're good, but there are issues with them. So that's kind of why they haven't ramped up and, and, and built more of these desalination plants. Um, because of some of the issues that come with them. But yes, Carlsbad is a big one that is, is online. And they're, uh, I think they're doing 50 million gallons a day. I uh, Yeah, I wanna say 12, 2012. Okay, so this is kind of a fact about usage of, 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 of a product. So how much, does it, how much water do you think it takes to grow a hamburger? For one, this is for one hamburger. Okay. You're way low. For one hamburger, it takes about four thousand to eight thousand gallons. This is this is or eighteen thousand, excuse me. So, how much to grow a T-shirt? Seven hundred gallons. Right. So now, if you're like me, you know I'm probably in a thousand thousand gallon T-shirt here because I'm a little. A little bigger. See? See? I can make fun of myself too. <laughs> That's all right. I don't mind. So, a single load of laundry, how much do you think you use in a single load of laundry? It's 40. No, go ahead, please. Sorry, I'm. It's a correlation between the hamburger. And the you know, I eat more hamburgers, <laughs> so I had to have bigger t-shirts. So I'm just, I'm just, I'm. Correlation. <laughs> it's okay. I can take it. I know, I know, I know what size I am. <laughs> so yes, every time you do a load of laundry, it takes 40 gallons. Now, what's the big thing about what? What is what is our, our the big mantra that you, when you do a load of laundry, you should use a, a? What's that? Make it a full load exactly. So it doesn't matter if it's full or if it's if it's half empty, it's gonna do the same cleaning, but you wanna make sure you, you wash more clothes at one time. Um, they've got them down to about 26 gallons. So yeah, they're they're a little better, but they're still there's still kind of quite a bit of water. Okay, so what kind of skills do you need in the water industry? These are the ones you need. You need to be able to work as a team all directions, planning, problem solving. You need to be able to work with your hands. Academic skills, math, science, reading, writing, critical thinking. Now, not all these are for every position, but in general, you're gonna need to be able to, to have a few skills to work in the water industry. And now I'm not saying anybody doesn't have skills, but these are the things you're gonna to wanna to really, really brush up on. You know, I, I will be the first to admit, I can't write, save my life. But you know what? I'm really good at science and math. And so I've paired myself, my boss is fantastic. If I have to write something, I kind of throw up on the paper and then she takes it and she makes it look pretty. Um, that's, that's the relationship that we have developed and, and, and we're a pretty good team when we do stuff. So, you know, these are the stuff that you're gonna wanna look for. So what is your career path gonna look like? Here are some of the different options. We have, you know, engineering, uh, there's policy and planning. I'm kind of somewhere right in the middle of these two. Um, currently, I am in a master's program to become an environmental engineer, and basically what I'm learning is how to better uh, design 
things so that they're more environmentally friendly. And I am doing a lot of policy and planning at the state level to help them understand how in the future people can learn and people can be educated and do things better. You have organizational, this is kind of like your administrative, people who are talking to customers, people who are you know, setting up meetings, people are doing all this stuff, science and environment. So when you come out to our office and you have our, our, your big day at our office, you're gonna meet all the scientists that we have. We actually have a mobile uh, science lab that we drive out into the field and they, we do science experiments in the middle of the desert. So you're gonna see why that's important. And then communication, education, I'm kind of over here too, because I'm here educating you. I'm technically at work right now. Um, my, my boss is in charge of our communications department. She does all of our media, uh, talking to the newspaper, talking to you know anybody who, who has questions about what we do. Uh, and then you have operational maintenance trades. And so this is gonna be anybody who is gonna be swinging a shovel, gonna be digging holes, gonna be fixing pipes, you know, gonna be running the system, gonna be running the, the operational portion of the system. So typically a wastewater operator, this is somebody who has a high school diploma or a two year degree in water quality. Um, and this, there is a lot of on the job training and a certificate that's required, but you know, there are some salary ranges right there. These, these are a little bit low, I think. I don't, I'm not gonna, you know, you guys can look at, at jobs and, I recommend you guys look at certain job sites to, to figure out what, what you want to do if you want to work in this industry. Um, so a lab technician, this is somebody who's going to be, you know, testing water quality, who's going to be testing wastewater, making sure that the right chemicals are going in. They're going to be testing and do, doing things called jar testing. They're going to be doing um, all different kinds of testing to make sure that what we're, they're doing at maybe a treatment plant is correct. So those, this is a big job. And then to become an engineer which is kind of a long process. You do need a four-year degree, typically in engineering, and a, what's something called a PE, or a professional engineering license, to become an engineer. So, how do you get started? I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna go too long about this, but you know, attend a career fair. There's career fairs in water all the time. Um, you know, participate in water-related special events. If you live in Spring Valley Lake, or Hesperia, Oak Hills, any of those areas, um, look at your local water agency. They're always having little events where you can come out and learn what they do and see what they do, and get more involved. Uh, three is you can join a student chapter or, or just become friends with this guy because he has all the connections in the water world. Um, find a water professional. Uh, if you, what's that? <laughs> not yet, not yet. So find a water professional to be your mentor. I mean, this is this is a, this is really good. You can do job shadowing. You can come in. You can meet different people. You know, whatever it is that you you want to do, you can you can kind of you know become friends. Um, so how did I become where I am today? I actually became friends with some people in the water industry and started to go to different like little meetings. And then when I found out that my position was the position that I wanted opened. I applied, and, and I'll be honest with you, when I first applied, I wasn't 100% qualified. I had certain qualifications that made me very desirable, but I wasn't, I, I didn't meet the qualifications as they were read in the job description. So just because you may not have exactly what you need, it, it shouldn't stop you from doing what you want. And then five, you know, maybe have a water education day at your school or, or set up or, or, or volunteer to help at one of the other you know, water uh, related events. So I'm gonna tell you a quick story about me and then I'll be done. Um, so how do you get started? You need to work hard. I'm gonna give you some advice. Don't, don't try to climb the ladder. You know, everybody wants to be at the top instantly, right? Everyone wants to be a manager. Everyone wants to be the, the you know, the president, the owner, whatever it is. You all wanna start at the top. You wanna to try to get pulled up the ladder. You wanna have people see your hard work, see your persistence, and you wanna be able to have them pull you up. So when I started working, I, I started in the golf course industry. My dad was a golf course superintendent. I loved being outside. So I started going to school to become a turf grass management major. I worked at Apple Valley Country Club. My first year, I dug 3,286 holes. One year, I dug 3,000 holes because I was changing out all the, all the irrigation heads on the entire golf course. Well, so the next year I came back after going to school and guess what? My boss, he said, wow, you did a fantastic job last year. You dug all these holes. 
you basically worked your butt off, you did extra over and above work, I'm gonna give you a promotion to becoming our spray tech. And so I became the spray tech. And I did that to the best of my ability. And then the next year I came back and I was the assistant superintendent. And the assistant superintendent is basically the manager of the whole system who is gonna be in charge of telling everybody, you know, where to go, what to do, what to be, what projects we're doing, how we're doing the projects, being in charge of all this stuff. So you, you, you may not start where you wanna start, but if you work like you wanna work to be at that spot, people will notice and people will bring you along because they're gonna wanna have you in that position. So I don't know if I used my time right, but that's what I have. And uh, if you have any questions, you feel free to take my phone number down. My email address is really easy. It's my first initial, last name, at mojavewater.org. You feel free to email me if you have any questions. Um, please you use me as a resource. That's what I'm here for. So I, I, I me and Neville, we, we jest a little bit, but I definitely respect him and I hope he respects me. And, and I love coming to talk to you guys and I love doing all this stuff. So. Yeah, one of, one of the things that I think is really 